And we are recording. Perfect. Okay, so uh, before I start the lecture today, let me just ask, uh, is there any questions related to uh, any of the lab work or any of the materials that we've covered over the last couple of lectures since we pivoted to backend services? Okay. If not, well, today's lecture. Okay, perfect. And if so, um, did I? Yeah, I did the, the link. Uh, and if there are any questions, you can always just direct them in the um, in the Discord channel. Let me do this. Let me do this. Let me collapse this. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, respond to the proposals uh, probably starting uh, later today and tomorrow. Okay, let's see here. I can see. Do I still get yeah, there? So, uh, and likely what I'll do is I will get in touch via a um, via Discord. And I'll, tr I'll do a, uh, I'll send out a message to all parties involved uh, in each of those proposals. So if you're a group of, say, three individuals, I will send, I will start a dialogue uh, in Discord that would contain all three of those. Actually, what would be easier on me is if uh, each of the groups can send me a, uh, send me a message that includes all the group members inside Discord so that we can start having a, uh, a dialogue on your application. And that way I can manage communication to all of the groups that way. We could just continue to use Discord, but we'll use it in a means to be able to just have uh, group to instructor uh, communications. Okay, with that said, I want to spend or dedicate to this uh, lecture towards talking about Express and what Express is. And the labs for this are already available to you. So if you've already started working on it, you might already, you might already have an idea of what Express is. Let's close that. So Express is a Node web framework. So Node is an amazing tool for building networking services and applications. We already talked about how it utilizes JavaScript, which was really designed to be a uh, client end application. And then it just recently, in the last 11 years, expanded out to be a uh, server side programming language. But since its um, impetus was to go ahead and be used in networking services, there's a lot of built in tools for that case. And so that's why building applications, network applications, web applications is pretty painless, all things considering using JavaScript. So Express builds on top of the features already provided in Node to make building the web server component of your application much easier. Uh, so it provides easy to use functionality that satisfies the needs of your web servers. So in the previous lab, in lab eight, I had you build a web server, basic web server using just the HTTP uh, modules. That's one of the core modules included in Node just to see how we could use Node by itself to build a web server and so for you to understand what the roles and responsibilities of web servers are. And it wasn't necessarily complex, but you wouldn't want to have to code that every time you designed a web application. It'd be a lot of essentially um, uh, uh, boilerplate code you would need every time you started up a new project. And so this is what Express provides to us. Express allows us to expressly create web servers and it handles all of what you essentially did in lab eight in very few lines of code. So Express is open source, it's free, it's easy to extend, it's very performant and has lots and lots of pre-built packages that you could just drop in and use to perform all kinds of server related tasks. So this is why we're going to be using this. Uh, technology. So in order to install Express, there's two ways we can do this. We can either inside of our package.json, and I mentioned this uh, 
last lecture when I was talking about the new package manager or NPM. NPM is what we use to install all the modules, all third party modules that we would like to use in our web applications, in the back end of our web applications. Uh, and with that said, you want to think of NPM as a build tool. So when NPM will not only manage our dependencies and install all the modules we want and all of the dependent modules for those modules, but it can also take care of versioning and uh, and define the the uh, the paths in which you have to go ahead and uh, start executing your software, or you can actually have uh, multiple execution points that you can define inside define inside of your uh, package.json. So the package.json is essentially going to be the configuration file. It's your file, it's your manifest for your web application. And so we use NPM to go ahead and uh, launch our application or install our application. Another way that we can go ahead and uh, install Express is just right from the command line. So we could do npm install Express and tell that to save. And actually, let me see what happens. Let's see if I could show you what happens if we do that. Uh, that's where my terminal is. New window. OK, so let's go into desktop. And I think inside my desktop, I have, yeah, uh, We'll go into this new problem. I think I made, uh, yeah, let's go into Express. Is there anything in here? Okay, there's nothing in here. Let's clear this. Okay, so if I do npm install Express and then tell it to save, it's going to go ahead and install. So now if I do ls, Yeah, I should, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if we can't. It's equal to the require. Yeah, so now inside of this folder, I will have the ability to also access Express that way. Excellent. So these are just two different ways to do it. Uh, to, to do an installation, you could either do it directly from the command line, or you could just add a dependency into your package.json. And when you do an npm install, it'll go ahead and install that into your node modules folder, which is where it, it uh, where all your third-party modules will get installed into. So just a quick overview of like a hello world written in Express. We would import the Express module using the require keyword and bind that to some variable that we have inside of our, this module scope. Then Express itself, we will go ahead and invoke. This is a function that will essentially uh, build out a uh, the web server that we need or the application logic that we would need. So we will invoke Express and then bind that to some variable. Let's call it app. And then once we have this express application object, we have all sorts of built-in methods that help facilitate a web server, such as being able to have uh, the ability to define a git uh, method. And then so the first, in this particular example, the first uh, parameter is the uh, essentially your, your path, so your URL that you're listening on. So this would just be the root path. And the second would be the callback function that you want to respond when there is a git request at this URL, at this path. And so a callback function would take in a request and a re response object. And this is provided through the um, through node and the express framework. So these are generated for us whenever we do get a request. And then we, in this instance, we will send back as a response, just hello world. So this is a hello world using Express. Now, once we've defined a route, 
and a action that happens on this route when we get that request, we will actually set our server up to start listening. The first parameter here is the port number we want to listen to. And then the second optional parameter is some callback function that you want to trigger once the server launches. It's pretty common to actually just do a console log to say that the server is ready or the server is listening on some, some port or, or some path with some port number. And if we want to launch this, if we just save this into a JS file, we could just launch that right with Node. And so here, if we opened up the browser to port 3000 on local host, because the default is local host, then we would get this message, hello world. And again, you'll, you will actually build something like this in lab uh, nine. But you can see how much easier it is to, in what is this, four lines of code, you're able to build a web server in what took, how many lines of code did lab eight end up being? It's, it's much, much more than four. Okay. So let's talk about some of the HTTP methods inside of Express. Uh, so there's a method for every HTTP verb. So we could do like app.get or app.post or app.put or app.delete. And these are all going to define those, that, that HTTP verb, that method uh, from the request. And then again, like I said, you have at least two parameters where the first is going to be the path that you're going to be listening on for a request. And the second is what callback function you want to trigger when a request of that type of that method is, um, is, uh, is hit, is, is, is uh, actually triggered. So express, sends us uh, these two objects in the callback, the request object and the response object. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about what's inside these objects. The request is obviously the HTTP request object, including the parameters, the header, the body, and the response is the HTTP response object that we send back to the client. So again, the role or responsibility of a web server is to listen to HTTP responses, and, I mean, uh, request, I'm sorry, request, and provide back responses. Okay, so the request parameters, there's lots of different parameters that a request object can have. Um, big ones are gonna be like the body of the request. So that could be data that's being transmitted to the web server, a cookie that could be used to maintain uh, session information they have the method that was used, any parameters, uh, the URL path, the protocol, the query. So let's look at some of the things we can do with that request object. Suppose we get have a get request and there is data in the form of a query string. If we want to use Express to be able to access that data, uh, well, Express makes it super easy inside the request is an actual query, uh, query object. So this object is filled with a property for each query parameter. And if there's no query parameters, if there's no query string, then it would just be empty. So an example of how we might access this would be if I go ahead and set up a express uh, application. So let's go ahead and import express. And then from that express module will go ahead and launch the application and bind that to an app variable. We can create some kind of callback function. So in this instance, with the request and response, we will just console log the request, the query to the request, and then I'll set up a route. So on a get method, we will listen to the uh, root directory and we will invoke this callback function, handle get, and then we'll just listen on 8080. Okay, so let's see, actually, let's see if I can't, uh, let's see if we can't just set this up and actually test this. Let's see how we can, what we get if we console log this request.query. So let me post, uh, 
work. Oh, no, I got to be in node. Let's go to node and let's paste that code. Okay, so let's see here. So if I go into here, oh, let's see, let's go to localhost, not there, let's 8080. And let's say that I go ahead and pass in this uh, this um, query string, right? So it starts with a question mark where F name is Ted and L name is Homeburg. And if I hit enter, I will then see right inside of my instance running inside the rebel that I can go ahead and access that query string and it's already parsed for me, key value pair. So this is one example of how I was able to pass data from my client side right into my server side using the query string and how easy it was to do that uh, using using Express. Okay, let's talk about other ways we might go ahead and do this. Suppose that we have a, uh, a post request. Inside this post request, we have some data either in the form of a JSON or as a query string. And I want to access that. Well, Express makes this pretty easy as well. Now, depending on whether the data is passed as a JSON, a JavaScript object notation, or if it's in the form of a query string, it's going to depend on what the header inside the request uh, declares the content type as. So if the content type is declared as an applica application slash JSON, then we would want to go ahead and parse it as JSON data. If the header is... Um, query string. If it's set as a query string, then we would want to, we would know this based off of the uh, header in our request object as having the content type of application slash x www.form-url uh, encoded. So depending on those two things, if it's a JSON, then we could just go ahead and do express.json to parse our JSON data. If it is uh, data that has been encoded into the URL itself as a string query, then we would just use express.url encoded. But express, regardless of how it gets sent, express provides a method to be able to parse it and access it right from the body. And here you can see, in both cases, we can access that data right in the request body. So in Git methods, typically Gits don't have bodies. It's very common for Gits just to have um, uh, query strings. And posts typically have bodies. And usually we go access from the body whatever data attributes, such as name or F name or whatever I have encapsulated inside that request. OK. Let's talk about the response object inside of Express. Suppose that we want to send a response, because recall, recall that in this uh, in the communication between a client and a server, web client and web server, it's contingent on our web server to not only take that request, but to send back a response and then terminate that connection. So how do you send a response back to the client using Express? Well. Inside of the response object, there is a send method, and then we can just send a message back. So in our example, our hello world example, we did response.send and then just the string hello world. Now, if we pass a string, then the response content type header will be text slash HTML. Now, if we were to pass an object or an array, some, some reference data type into send, then it would send back a response with the content type header of application slash JSON so that we can actually provide data back to our client, our web client. And then once it's in the web client, the web client could potentially parse that and use that on the front end of the application uh, as a JavaScript object. So two things we should talk about what SIN does automatically for us. It sets the content length of the HTTP response header for us, and it closes the connection. 
So those are two things that we need to do as a web server that just gets handled automatically for us by invoking that method. In addition to send, there's also this end. So the end is used to send an empty response. So this is just an alternative way to send the response without a body from the response. Again, this is from the response object. So we could do send or end. Send takes in data and it's just empty. It just closes the connection. So recall that the client sends a request that has an HTTP method and the response from the web server has some status code, some response code. And so we briefly mentioned that when we talked about HTTP uh, from the client perspective, and we'll, we'll probably go more in depth in HTTP from a web server perspective next lecture. But, but for our purposes, we will say that Express can easily send back a status code using the status method. So every response has a status method and you can just put in the status code. And then afterwards you can do uh, either dot end or dot send and then supply some message in addition to that status code. So again, we can chain a set of methods one after the other on these response objects. So on the response, we will we will set the status to 404 and then we will end the connection. On the response, we will set the status to 404 and then also send and close the connection, but send back the data file not found. Now there's a shortcut for, since, uh, for us to send back these HTTP responses where we could just do send status. And so that's the same as doing status 200.send OK or uh, response.status 403.send forbidden. So these really common ones that, uh, uh, that we would normally have, these descriptors that are typically associated with the status codes are pre-baked right into Express. OK, so suppose that we wanted to send uh, JSON. Well, we saw how we could use send, or we, we talked about how we can use send to not only send text or uh, HTML text, but we could also send JavaScript objects or arrays. And so here's just an example of doing this on this slide. And so the nice thing about uh, sending your data in a response using .json, so you can send a JSON, is when you uh, invoke the .json method, it'll actually take the contents of your, um, of your JavaScript object and actually encode it into valid, uh, a, a, as a valid JSON. So we'll talk a little bit more into what the JSON specification is as it's more strict than actual JavaScript objects. And I'll, I'll talk about that when I have that lecture. Okay, so let's see. So we talked about how with, with responses, we can send back uh, data in the form of .send. We talked about how we can just close the connection with .end. We talked about how we could uh, send a JSON in a response by doing .json and then passing in some data. So the next thing I want to talk about is in the response, we can send cookies as well. And so cookies are used to be able to manage sessions. So when we send a cookie, to the browser or the web client, the web client can manage the cookie and every time they send out another request, they can include the cookie and we can use that cookie from the web server to, to identify a client. And so this is a way to have a statefulness between a web server and a web client with, in, with using a protocol, which is HTTP, HTTP, which is stateless in and of itself. So each response object from the Express framework has a cookie method and this cookie method allows us to manipulate our cookies. And so just an example of this is from the response object, we could do cookie and then pa pass in a key value pair where the key would be username and the value would be foobar. 
And there's other parameters we can also set, such as a, um, a third parameter would be an object containing a set of uh, relevant data, such as domain or path, or whether this is a secure HTTPS, or whether this cookie should expire or when it should expire. And so these are the um, most useful parameters that you can typically set inside of a cookie. So the domain, the expiration, HTTP only sets the cookie to be accessible only by the web server. On the max age so, uh, of, of the cookie, the path that for, for uh, the cookie, whether it's on HTTPS, whether the set the cookie to be signed, versus unsigned, and then same site. Okay, perfect. And then you also have the option to clear a cookie. And you clear a cookie by passing in the key, and then it would clear that value. Okay, let's talk about inside the response object, the HTTP header. So we briefly kind of mentioned this in terms of being able to communicate what type of data is carried inside of the response's body. So you can access the HTTP header values from a request. Oh. Uh, so, by just doing request.headers. So, headers is a property that is inside both the, re the request and response. So, use, and then you can also use the uh, request he header methods to access an individual uh, value. So, say for instance, if we want to access the value of user agent, then you can pass in the key and it would dereference the value for that. So those are the two ways. So the headers is an object in and of itself that's inside the request object. And then you can pass in a parameter into that to get back the value of a particular uh, header uh, row. Okay. Let's see here. And so you could change any HTTP header value of a response by using the set method. So say for instance, in the response, you could set the content type to text slash HTML. There's a shortcut for content type in particular though, you could always just do response.type and then the, uh, the content type, the file type that you want to send. So dot HTML would be text HTML. Um, HTML would also be just text HTML, JSON would be application slash JSON. Application slash JSON would also be that. PNG would be image slash PNG. And I, I believe we covered this inside the lab where I had you define all the MIME types, uh, which is lab eight, to, to get an idea of what the content type is referring to. Okay. So other things that we can do from Express, so other roles that are very critical for a web server is the concept of redirects. So how can we redirect to other pages from our server side? Well, Express gives us a redirect method. And so the way the redirect method works is from the response object, we could just do dot redirect and then give it the, uh, essentially the path that we want to redirect to. So in this instance, when we get a, a request from this particular path, we would then redirect and send back a re response for the web client to go there instead. We can also send status codes alongside a redirect. So in this instance, we can send the status code of 301 and then do the redirect. We can specify either absolute paths or absolute URLs or relative paths inside the redirect. So we could do like dot dot to go back one level or we could just do uh, go there to go to a different route. Okay, now, since we're talking about redirects, let's talk more about routing. So routing on a web server is the process of determining what should happen when a URL is called, or also which parts of the application should handle a specific incoming request. So in that original hello world example I had, we used the code right here where we had from our express application, we set up a, uh, a route for a get 
method for a Git request. Did this Git request would trigger whenever it there was a request on just the root directory. And the callback function here was just the fact that they were takes in a request, takes in response that's given to us by Express uh, when the request comes in and we were executing an empty block of code. But this is essentially a general form of what a route looks like. So we can, when we define our routes, we can even have named parameters. And these are super useful for when we want to listen for custom requests. We'll actually see named uh, parameters uh, in either, I want to say lab 10 or lab 12. I'm pretty sure I, I use this in lab 10 for the number guessing uh, API. Because every time you generate a new number guessing game, it creates like a room code similar to uh, Jackbox games that you can then access. Multiple people can access your number guessing game room using that, uh, that, uh, that special key. And so in this example, we would say we want to create a REST service that takes a string and returns the uppercase equivalent of that string. And suppose with this particular service, we didn't want to send the data as a query string, but we wanted to encode that as part of the URL itself. Then if I wanted to create a route for something that's not predefined, for something that is itself a variable, this is how it would look. So from my Express application, I will set up a Git, uh, a route on for a Git request. This Git request is going to be on the path of slash uppercase slash and then a colon in front of uh, a name essentially creates it as a variable name. So let's say the value. And then in my callback function, once I have this, this part is now a named parameter in my route. In my callback function, I can now dereference this and expect this to come from part of the client request. So inside the request response, from the response, I can send back, and then here is the dereferencing right here. So from the request object is a parameters object. The parameters object can include that value, and that value is defined inside this route. So it's dereferencing it from the URL as this part of the route. And then in this example where we're just um, going ahead and uh, – uh, to take the string and make it uppercase, well, there's a, a method inside strings just to, to uppercase. But the takeaway here is inside of our request object is a params object, and we can access any name parameters from there. And again, you'll get a chance to actually see this in the lab, as, as it's a very useful uh, uh, thing to, to know when setting up routes on your web server. Uh, you can also use regular expressions to match a path when defining a route. So you can use, uh, say, for instance, here, when we set up for Git requests, we can use this regular expression that will then match to anything that has posts. So we could do slash post or slash post slash first or slash the post or slash post slash something and so on. We'll all, we'll all get handled by this callback function. So you have you have you have lots of different ways that you could set up routes. So while we're talking about web servers, it's pretty critical that we talk a little bit about cores and what that means. You might have already seen some cores um, uh, errors from the client side. So the question might be, how do you allow cross-site requests by enabling cores on your own web server? And to give a little bit of background information on this, uh, a JavaScript application running in the browser can usually only access HTTP resources on the same domain, which is what we call an origin that serves it. So loading images or scripts or styles always works, but fetch calls to another server will fail unless that server implements a way to allow that connection. So the way that you can enable that connection is what's called a cross-origin 
resource sharing. And that's what cores is a um, initialism for. So one very important thing that, ne that needs cores is these modules. So we looked at the ES modules when we were looking at client side code. Remember, we could not, we could not run that from the file protocol. We needed to use the HTTP protocol for that. And if we tried to open it in the file protocol, it gave us that cores error. So this is so this is an example of when we would have to enable cores. So this would and so if you don't have your course policy set up on your server, you wouldn't be allowed to uh, service those requests. You would get that error. And so let's take a look at what that request, uh, what a failure that request looks like. So I'm sure you've seen this before. So has been blocked by course policy. No access control allow origin headers present on the requested resource. So whenever you see something like this, uh, that means that that is something that's configured on the server side. So on your server, you can actually allow for uh, cross-origin sharing. So a cross-origin resource fails if it's from a different domain or different subdomain or different port or different protocol. And again, it's important to understand that this is here for security. It's to prevent malicious users to exploit uh, the, the, the web platform as it's so incredibly networked to other machines that you do not know uh, the, the um, safety of one way or the other. But if you control the server and the client of an application, then it's okay for you to enable these course policy. But by default, it's not allowed. So how do we set up our server to enable cores? Well, there is a course module. So there's this cores middleware package that we can easily implement into our express application by just importing it. So we can require cores and import this. This course package, this module is provided to us by the express framework. And so once we import this course module and once we launch the express application and get this app, Suppose that we go ahead and define this uh, callback function, handle git, that takes in a request, it takes in a response, and it takes in some next middleware function. So we'll talk a little bit about this next keyword and what the, what's happening there. And say, for instance, in this instance, on our response, we will send back a JSON that has this message that just says, whoa, with cores, it works. So to set up a route that allows us to do cores, across origin resource sharing, then on the root directory, so on this route that will handle a git request, we can pass in the cores module before we do the handle, before we do this git handle. And so I'll talk about this when we get to the slide, but this is what's called uh, middleware. So anything that happens between the request and the response is middleware inside of uh, our express framework. So cores is an example of a middleware function that allows us or enables us to, to handle or, or to uh, disregard the default security setting that can cause issues. Okay, before I talk about um, Middleware, I do want to talk a little bit about templating. And I don't know if I'll have a dedicated lecture on this or not, but uh, or if I'll just send you to the API page. But there is this concept that's called templating. Templating from the web servers where we can dynamically generate HTML files to send to the client instead of having something that is, uh, is uh, uh, pre-crafted and delivered as a static file. So, so far, what we have seen working on the client side has been just to generate static files. And that's what GitHub Pages does. But if we're running our own web server and if we're processing data, we can actually use that data uh, or the state of the uh, application and generate a dynamic HTML page that produces that view. So, um, 
In order to do that, that is what's called a template engine. So template engines add data to a view and generate HTML dynamically. There are multiple template engines out there, such as Pug or Handlebars or Mustache or EJ EJS. So just to give you an example of what this might look like, if you wanted to use Pug, you'd first have to install it. We use NPM to install anything. So NPM install Pug. And then when we initialize our Express app, we need to set it. So we would require Express, then we would initialize Express and then bind that to an app. And then once we have that application, we can say, oh, we're gonna actually set a view engine, which means that we wanna use a templating engine and the view engine we want to set in, in our app is going to be Pug. So Express supports a multitude of these templating engines. Um, and then once you have the view engine set, you can start writing your templates in, in this instance, it would be a pug file, a .pug file, and then you can create a view. So say for instance, we set up our route, we create a route that goes to an about page, so slash about. And so this will be for git method, HTTP git request. And the callback function in this instance, we take in uh, the request and response object. And on the response, in order to trigger this template engine, we would do dot render, and we will render the about. So we're just giving it the um, the file that we want to go ahead and uh, render as a response. And in this instance, suppose that my dot pug file inside. So suppose I had a directory called views. Inside the directory is a file called about.pug. Then this is what the actual um, syntax for the uh, for the template engine would use to generate HTML. So notice it does not look like pure HTML. There's the, its own unique syntax. In this instance, the P is specifying that this is supposed to be a uh, P element, a P tag, with the content of hello from foobar. So the result would look like this. Now, again, this is kind of useless because this is, uh, this is just static. So if all I wanted to do was produce static information from the server side to deliver to the client, I might as well have just made an HTML page. But if I was processing some data and I wanted to have a variable set instead of foobar, that's where the real strength of these template engines comes from. And so an example of what that might look like is when I tell the response to render, in addition to saying what, um, what a um, uh, file, what template to go ahead and use, in this instance, I would use the about.pug file. I can also, as a second parameter, pass in an object that has a key value pair so all the properties that I'd want to pass to that template. So in this instance, I just have one property, it's, it's name, and the value of name would be foobar. But inside of my template, I can actually do this hashtag and then curly braces and dereference from this object that gets passed by the render method, the value of name. And so this then allows me to create this template of HTML that I can dynamically change the name to based off of request or whatever processing is happening from the server. And so when I go to render a response to the web server, I mean, to the web client, I can produce some custom HTML just for that client. Okay. Anyway, that's just a quick, short introduction to Pug and just giving you a notion of what Express can do. Uh, and uh, just just to 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 uh, compare it, like the templating engines, the notion's pretty much all the same. So, like I said, there was support for several different templating engines. Conceptually, they, they they they're pretty similar. So, to give you one other quick example, suppose instead we want to use handlebars. Well, if we want to use handlebars, we install it. npm install hbs. And then we would, instead of having a .pug file, we'd have a .hbs file. So inside of my view, my views folder, I would instead have about .hbs. And so here, this is how my syntax would differ. Hello from, and then I would have uh, curly brace, curly brace, and then the dereference. 
inside of the template file. And then inside the actual application, my web server, I would import handlebars here, HBS. I would set the view engine inside of my express application to HBS for handlebars. I'd also set uh, the path to views. So when I give a file name, I don't have to give the full name. So here, when I sent in my response, the ability to render is going to, since my path on views was set here, it will look for that about.hbs template. And then I pass data the exact same way. So regardless of the, the actual template uh, syntax, what, what, whatever module you're using, whether it's handlebars or EJS or, um, or uh, pug, the call in Express is always the same. You set a view engine, you invoke a render method and you say, you, you provide the file name where the template is and then an object that contains the properties and values that you're passing to that template. And to give one final example, suppose you wanted to do server side rendering with Express for your React views. And we'll have a dedicated lecture uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks on React itself. We can also do that. So we saw how to do this with Pug. We saw how to do this with, um, with uh, handlebars, with React. It's very similar. The process is we would install the module we would need. In this instance, it's Express React Views. Then we would have, instead of a .pug file, we would have reactuses.jsx files. So inside of our Fuse folder, we would have a about.jsx, in which case it would have our React code here. And so you can see with React, it's pretty similar. We would import the React module, we would define a class called, say, for instance, hello message that extends a React component. Every React component has to have a render method that returns the HTML. And in this instance, the HTML will dereference the name property from the properties that gets passed to it. And then we just export that so that inside of my Express application, I import the React module here. I would set the engine, so app.engine will be set to JSX. And inside here, I will then invoke off this React to create a view engine. And then to actually send that back as a response, I would do response.render just like I've seen before. I would give it the value, the name of the JSX file, so about. And then I'd pass the data in as a object. But yeah, so the point is, I just want to show how you can use a template engine to uh, interface with Express. And really, it doesn't matter how what, what template engine you use. It's, it's the same regardless. OK, so now I want to talk about another really big thing that Express provides to us. So in addition to wrapping up all these uh, web server methods in a nice package, it also has this really great modular support for middleware functions. So let me define what middleware is. Middleware is a function that hooks into the routing process, i.e. our request response chain to perform some operation. So it's, it's, it's commonly used to edit, say, for instance, the request or response objects or to terminate the request before it reaches the route handler code. So it's added to the execution stack like this. And so we've seen this before already uh, when we're talking about cores, but we'll for, more, more formally talk about it now. So we could do app.use, and then whenever we use some middleware, the middleware comes in the form of a function as a callback function. The parameters of that callback function is it has to take in a request, it has to take in a response, and it has to take in the next function inside of our request response chain. So, and that's just labeled as next. So we don't have to know that. Express actually manages that for us. So we just supply uh, uh, the next 
uh, identifier and that gets filled in for us just like response gets filled in and just get, request does as well. And so this is similar to defining a route, but in addition to the request and response objects, there's also that next middleware function. And you always, so this is the trick though, when you're defining a middleware function, you always call the next method at the very end of the function to pass the execution to the next handler. So this is a, just an alias for a callback function that will get passed into there. And the very last of those callback functions that will get passed into there will be whatever the route handler function is designed to be. And if you don't call that next uh, uh, method inside of a middleware function, then essentially that's gonna terminate your response prematurely uh, because it's gonna stop the chain of this request response, the request response chain at that point. So this is just how we're able to pass control from one callback function to another. Anyway, there's there, you typically use pre-made middleware, although you can make your own and we will do uh, middleware, we will make our own middleware in one of these labs, one of these express labs. But if you want to see the big, big listing of middleware packages that are available to you, I have included it right here inside this slide. But uh, just to give some examples of how we might use this, suppose that we want to use the cookie parser middleware, which is used to parse cookies in the request object inside of the cookies property. Well, if we want to use that, first we have to install it into our app. So we could do npm install cookie parser, or we could just add it directly into our package.json's dependency and just do npm install that way. Uh, and then to use it, we would have to go ahead and import it. So we use the require keyword and the name of the module, and then we will bind that to a variable. So we have access to it. And then when we go to set up our route, so here we set up a route a for a git method at the root directory. We're gonna have this uh, callback function for the route handler to go ahead and send a response of hello world, but I can also just go ahead and do app.use and then the this function here actually invoke the function of cookie parser. And so since this is predefined as a middleware, since it's a pre-built middleware for us, every time this route gets hit, it will then also parse that cookie for us. Okay, let's give in another example. So we can also set a middleware function to run just on a specific route and not all the routes by using as the second parameter of our route definition. So inside this example, suppose that I create this function that is called my middleware. And inside this function, the parameters are a request, a response, and a next parameter. And the way that this would work is I would have whatever my code is inside of this middleware that does whatever it needs, it pulls whatever data it needs from the request, processes, whatever it has to do, then loads whatever data it needs back into the response object. But the very last line of code has to be to be invoke whatever this next method is. But, and that gets passed to us by Express. And then suppose that I actually have my uh, my route handler, so let's say this is handle get, that just takes in the request and response. And the very last thing we wanna do is to have this response just send hello world. Well, the way that I could set up on this particular route, that middleware is when I define that route, so app.get, and I'm doing a git that's looking at just the root directory, it will use this, my middleware, and then it would do handle git. So essentially, this is the chain of callback functions that will trigger when a git method occurs at this, at this route, at this path. And the way that we're able to move from this my middleware to this handle git is by invoking this next method. So what essentially Express is doing is that it's providing a request response and then the reference to next, it will provide as handle git. So what's really happening is after this code for the middleware gets executed, 
it's actually then going to invoke the handle get method. And I could just have a series of middleware calls on this route. So I could have like my middleware one, my middleware two, my middleware three, and iteratively kind of invoke one after the other by just having these next methods called. Okay. Uh, another thing that's pretty important conceptually for middleware is being able to store data between these functions that you can access between these functions. So if you need to store data that's generated in a middleware to pass it down to some other middleware function or to the request handler, you can use the request object inside of it is a locals property. It's an object itself and you can attach data there and that will carry over the request objects and the response objects are provided in every one of these middleware functions. And so you can carry data from one function to the other that way. And so just an example, suppose you wanted to have a variable called name with a value of foobar, then from the request object, you have that locals property. And so that locals property, you can define something like name or foo or whatever, and then set the value of it. Okay. So in addition to dynamic HTMLs and JSONs, another common use case of a web server is just to serve static files. So these are files that you might have already crafted yourself that are not dynamically generated. And so you can use Express to serve static assets directly from a folder. It doesn't just have to be HTML files. It can be images. It can be CSS. It can be, uh, it can be anything. So to do that, all you have to do is inside of your Express application, tell it to use the static keyword right here. So Express itself has a static method and you give it the uh, folder, the directory that you want to be able to host static files from. And it's that easy. That's, so here, say if you had an index.html file inside that public folder, and now if you were to set a send a request to localhost, it will automatically go ahead and serve from that, that uh, whatever folder was passed here, those static files. And I believe this, this, this is covered in the lab as well. So Express also provides a handy method to transfer a file as an attachment. So inside the response object, you could just do dot download. So just an example, this is when I define my route inside of the callback function, the request handler, I could do on the response dot download and pass the path of the file that I wanted to download. So again, these are, I'm starting to get to very specialized use cases. You might never have to do this, but if you do have to download data uh, uh, files like PDFs or whatnot to a client, this is just the mechanism you have available. And you can even set files to have custom file names with the second parameter. So if you were to hit the, um, the path slash file.pdf, you can actually have it download user-facing-filename.pdf instead. You can even define callback functions so something happens on your web server in response to something being downloaded. Like say, for instance, you want to log that information or whatnot. Okay, another super important concept though about our web server is sessions. We we, we talked briefly about this when talking about the cookies method, but I want to go into a little bit more detail on how we can use sessions to identify users across requests, because that is something that's going to be very, very important when you start wanting to uh, not just have pages that are the same for all clients, but are custom for each individual uh, web client that's making requests. So by default, Express requests are sequential and no request can be linked to each other. There's no way to know if this request comes from a client that has already performed a request previously. So users cannot be identified unless using some kind of mechanism that makes it possible because HTTP is stateless. So this is what sessions are used for, to be able to identify if a client has already been uh, uh, served by our web server. So when implemented, every user of your, your API or, or website will be assigned a unique session, and this allows you to store that user state. And to do this, there is a module from Express called Express-Session, 
which can help maintain your, uh, your sessions. So the way this works is, well, you would install it, npm install express dash session. And then inside your app, you would import that. And then that would be middleware. So we would use it the way we would talk, we talked about using middleware. So in this instance, we would use the use keyword on our express app. And so after we import session, we can invoke session by giving it a secret key, essentially. So all requests to the app routes are using uh, session and secrets is the only required parameter. There are more than that, but you always have to provide some kind of secret that each client has. And it should be some randomly unique string for your application. And that's that will allow you to identify your uh, your web clients. So the session is attached to the request, so you can access it from request.session. And then every time the client goes ahead and sends a request, that request will contain that session information. So the object can be used to get data out of the session and to also uh, set data inside. So this is just a mechanism to be able to share data between your web server and web client. So for instance, you can have request.session.name and then give it foobar and then do console.log and actually see that name. The data is serialized as the JSON, so it's safe to use nested objects. And you can use sessions to communicate data between middleware as well. So this is another mechanism besides uh, that local property. But the nice thing about using uh, sessions is it's also data that's available and exposed on the client side as well. So where is this session data stored at? Well, it really depends on how you set up your Express Session module. So you can either store the session data in memory. Of course, that's not what you should do for production. You could send that session data to a database like Mongo, or you could send it to a memory cache like Redis or, or Memcache. All solutions, though, well, which, uh, the default one is memory, but all these solutions store the session ID uh, in a cookie and keep the data server side. The client will receive the session ID in a cookie and will send it along with every HTTP request. So, so there is another popular package that you can get for Express to also manage sessions. It's called Cookie Session. Um, this one has more limitations than the one we just covered. It stores essentially all the session data client side in the cookie, whereas the one we just looked at stores all of your Express Session so it stores all the data on the server side. And so it could either be on the web server's memory or it could be in a database, as I mentioned. But in this instance, the, this data itself would be sent to the client and offload the storage onto the client. But because that the data is sent every time a request is made back and forth, you're only allotted a very small amount of data. So there's only four kilobytes of data that you can go ahead and uh, uh, nest this way. So this one, it's popular and it's another mechanism to share data between a web server and a web client, but it's going to have a severe limitation on how much data you can uh, store. And also all that data gets transmitted in every request and response. So there's a little bit of overhead there. Okay, so we talked about sessions, we talked about middleware, we talked about uh, routes. Uh, we talked a lot about, I think, what uh, a web server's responsibilities are for web clients. Uh, the last bit that I think is worth mentioning is the concept of being able to validate input that comes from forms or from a web client in general. So we can go ahead and uh, validate any kind of input with Express Validator. So again, there is another module that is part of the um, framework that we can use to ensure that things like names or strings and have at least three characters or that these are real email addresses or that an age falls between some kind of scope. So if we wanna ensure that our data fills some kind of parameters, 
we can just rely on this module to do that for us. And so how do we use this? Well, we have to install it, npm install express validator. Then we have to import it. What we're gonna import here is when we uh, use the required keyword to import express validator, in particular from express validator, we wanna import the check module. We will dereference that from the export object that we get from there to just get the check method. And so then we can pass an array of check calls as a second parameter of, say for instance, a one of our uh, of our routes that we declare. So every check call accepts the parameters name as argument. So look at this route that we define as an example. So on our Express application, we will define a post route, and the post route will listen on slash form path, and then at, on this parameter we can pass in an array that checks each of those individual things. So we will use that check function for some, uh, a property that's defined as name, as a property defined as email, and as a property that's defined as age. And then we will then have it check, is the length three, is this an email or is this numeric? So all these really common things that we need to validate are predefined as method calls inside check. And then after that, so if there was an error that occurred here, this would send back a response to the web client with some predefined message that said, oh, that's not a valid email, or oh, that number is uh, outside the scope that we want, or it's not a number, or oh, the uh, name there didn't hit, hit the min requirements. So provided he did not send back a response because of an error here, then we would do from the request body, we can then access that and do whatever we need to do inside of our server. So this is just illustrating whatever we're looking to do with the data that we're getting from that form. And in terms of all the different methods available to us for uh, validating, uh, what's going on here? We have lots. I'm not gonna go into any of all of these. I'm just illustrating there's a lot of things you can validate. Okay, I'm just gonna skip past this because I think that kind of expresses the point. I also wanna talk about sanitizing your inputs. So now that you've seen to how you can validate input that comes from the outside world to your Express app, there's one thing uh, that you should also understand is to uh, ensure that any input that you do get, even if it is valid, you, you might not necessarily be able to trust. So again, you can use Express Validator to sanitize the input in addition to um, validating it. And so an example of how we might do this is suppose, for instance, we have this post endpoint that we defined. So on our Express app, we have this route that's listening to forms and our callback function. We're taking from the request body, a name and email and an age. So these are the fields inside the form that we will then bind to these variables on our server side. Okay, let's see if I can't move. Then we might validate those like we saw previously by using the check function from the validator. We might go ahead and then sanitize them by doing these additional calls. So to trim and escape. So trim will uh, take and remove white spaces from the string. Escape will replace particular symbols from your string so that the data that you have that's coming in, you can ensure fits a format that your internal logic for parsing your string meets. You might have normalized email, which will uh, accept, which will uh, allow you to format your email address in a very specific way. So anyway, there's multitudes of these sanitizing functions that you have inside of uh, the validator. I don't care about that. And I think the last thing I just wanted to bring up with Express was uh, being able to handle forms.
And so if you want to process a form with Express, imagine if you had an HTML form like this, so form tags, the method sends a post request, the action hits this URL of slash submit dash form. It has an input for username and then it has a submit button. So when the user presses the submit button, the browser will automatically make a post request to this endpoint to this route submit dash form, the URL on the same origin of the page, sending the data it contains. It'll encode that as an application slash xww dash form dash URL encoded. And so in this case, the form data contains a username as the input field. So forms can also be sent using a get method, but the vast majority use post methods. So on our express side, if we want to go ahead and access that, uh, we could use this middleware express.url encoded. So right here, express.url encoded, and we will just use app.use to use that middleware. And so now when we set up a post route at sla uh, slash submit dash forms inside of this callback function for a request handler, we can access from the body of the request that username and do whatever we want with it. So again, all of our form data is just ni nicely encapsulated into the body of a request. Excellent, and that's pretty much it. If you want to, if you're building an application where your users might have to upload data, I added a couple slides for that. Uh, but I think this is a very, uh, very specific thing that I only added for those of you who, for some reason, has like users uploading pictures or whatnot. And so I, I wanted to give you a reference point for that. But that's it. That is Express and all of the things it provides for you. And you will get a chance to do all of these, use all of these uh, elements of Express pretty, uh, pretty in depth, I think, over the three labs that I signed, and there's going to be another lab uh, that I'm going to sign in the near future that will handle user authentication stuff that will really have you use uh, a lot of the middleware concepts of Express. Anyway, with that said, I have just a couple moments left over. Is there any questions in terms of uh, what Express is in terms of a framework and what, what it provides to you in developing your web servers or your server-side application? logic. Okay, sure. So let me, so what I'll do is I will field the question about homework five, but I will stop the recording now then if there's no questions so that we can have, I guess, a more concise recording for just the lecture.